good, good morning. Good morning. Ha ha, I beat you to it, good morning. Honey bunny. <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. We have a short very short six verses six verse chapter today are you kidding and uh, you might be wondering what we're going to do when we get to psalms because there's there's like three verse chapters and so forth and i haven't made a final decision on that but uh probably we will just amalgamate uh short chapters into something longer and handle two or three sure to make sure that uh, we proceed through course at at see 150 days 180 days would be six months i don't want to take five months to get through the book of psalms was it 119 that has all those verses yes psalms 119. And, <laughs> and get ready because psalms 119 is going to be fun <laughs> sarah said yeah i wondered <laughs> always thinking sarah you're awesome see what's the shortest what's the shortest chapter in the bible i used to know that we have to do Bible trivia one day with the chat oh, box. Oh, that'd be fun on the chat box. How many angels can dance on the head, head of a, a pen? pen. <laughs> Depends on the size of the angel. <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. Uh, okay, chapter 25 today. Well, we're plowing our way through. How many did you say? 42 chapters, honey? Of, um, 42 you know? chapters, and we're hearing... Today, for the last time, from Job's Comforters. It's kind of nice when you know they're about to wrap up all oh, that disdain of our father. <laughs> but we're going to listen to Job complain for about four chapters or more, actually. Maybe seven chapters. Okay. Job is going to... We'll grin and bear it. ...make <laughs> his complaint known. Uh, it's like one of my mentors one day said, Did you ever notice that... People who do something wrong tend to do a lot of it. <laughs> wow. Buckner, Brother Buckner oh, okay. said that to me. Uh, today, Job 25. Are you a worm? No. <laughs> uh, in this chapter, we hear the last time from Job's comforters. Bildad speaks up and he declares to Job that in his view, no one and nothing in creation can be made pure. You remember Job keeps defending himself and saying how righteous he is. And Elipaz is telling him, no, Job, you have hidden sin. Uh, Zophar is telling him, no, Job, you have open sin. And Bildad is telling him, you know, you're practically the Antichrist. And, and now that they cannot convince Job that he specifically is in sin, you'll see Bildad in the six verses of this chapter, he just simply says, look, Job, nobody is pure. All of creation is impure, and even God himself cannot justify a man. Wow. And so, you know, he's pushing oh, the argument, goodness. pushing the envelope. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he, so he goes so far as to suggest that even God himself cannot justify a man for any reason. And wow. He maintains his assertion that Job suffers at the hand of God because he is sinful. Job, likewise, agrees that it is in fact in his view God tormenting him but it is in spite of what a good guy he is what a good person I think we ought to rename you know we always say the patience of Job it should be about the patience of God it should be retitled yeah. by yeah. people yeah. patience yeah. of Job the patience of yeah. God you know you yeah. read through the book of Job and at what point do we consider him to be an example of patience <laughs> when he said that God right, is a yeah. fierce lion hunting him no. as the prey, is that you it should know? Should be the patience of God, yeah. honestly. Yeah. So, Kitty, I want you to read Job twenty-five, the entire chapter, verses one through six. All please. six of them, honey, uh, at yes. once. Okay. <laughs> and this at least is they don't Bill have Dad those. answering Job. Answering Job. Then answered Bill Dad the Shuhite and said. Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can, uh, can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less a man that is a worm? And the son of man, which is a worm. Ouch. It's like uh, amazing <laughs> grace that saved a wretch like me. 
And the problem with that, Amazing Grace is a wonderful hymn, but in most Christian Christians thinking, you're a wretch before you get born again and a wretch after you get born again. Not so. And that defies the plain truth, the teaching of the scripture. Mm. But for now, we're saying goodbye to Job's comforters. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming by. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. I remember <laughs> having people that would come to the house as, as a young pastor and they would stay for hours and hours and I'd finally get up and open the front door. Well, Pris, thank you so much for coming. We just love <laughs> you so much. And, you know, and even then it'd take them a little while to get out to the driveway and get in their car. Wow. Uh, what is the verse of scripture? Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house quickly, lest you grow weary with thee and hate thee. <laughs> uh, so scripture. Uh, Job will reply to Bildad for several chapters to come. And then we're going to hear from young Elihu the fourth man in this fire. <laughs> Elihu is a yet unknown presence in this drama. He hasn't been introduced yet. He's a younger man who stood by all this time listening to Job and listening to his three so-called friends. He is going to speak up and his words will get another perspective on all the events and dialogue we've studied thus far. In Bildad's brief comments here, we can sense his exhaustion. Can you tell that? Oh, yeah. Bill Dad's wore out. Mm -hmm. he's, he's just wore out. He's looking at his watch. <laughs> uh, he's just ready to just go home and, and just think I'll go home and see what the wife is doing. Uh, he and his three friends are worn out with this ongoing strife-filled exchange with Job. Uh, they haven't changed their minds, and they haven't influenced Job. The scripture says, by, by, only by pride comes contention. And if you're in contention, if you're one component of contention, there's pride involved. And I remember one of my mentors quoting that verse of scripture. See, the word of God, if, what is it, Hebrews 4.12, is a discerner. Mm -hmm. So let the word discern you. If you're in contention, there's pride. But I didn't start it. They're picking on me. That's pride. I have to defend myself. No, that's pride. It's pride on their part to pick a fight with you. It's pride on your part to respond. I never liked that. But if I believe what the book says, then if I'm in contention, I'm in pride. And what's the answer? Kitty says, go low and worship. worship. And get up and seek the kingdom. Don't answer your critics. And, of course, they will instantly presume that if you're not answering them as spiritual and humble as they are and as right as they are, they will conclude that your failure to respond or engage with them makes you arrogant, makes you reprobate, makes you stubborn. But you're not any of those things. You're just simply humbling yourself down to the response that... Moses had, when he said he was the meekest man in all the earth, and he was the guy that penned those words. Now the man Moses was meeker than all of the men <laughs> on the earth before him or after him. He said of himself. <laughs> so, well, don't we have a high opinion of ourselves? Uh, but yet it is to Moses' credit that when he was come against, he would simply fall on his face. And when he would fall on his face, the earth would open up and swallow his enemies. Mm -hmm. Abraham, when Lot's herdsmen strove against Abraham's herdsmen, Abraham said, Lot, what do you want? Just take what you want. And he did. And we know how that turned out for Lot. And we also know how it turned out for Abraham. Don't get involved in strife. I don't care if it's with your spouse, no with your children, with co-workers, people in church. Uh, don't get involved in strife. But Bill Dad, he's just exhausted, and they're, they're, here they are, they're convinced that Job is a terrible sinner, else he would not be suffering, which is exactly what Jesus dealt with millennia later when he talked about a building that collapsed on a handful of people that got killed. He said, do you think they were sinners more than those of you that weren't in that building, and that's why they died? He said, no, I tell you, they were not. And unless you change your way of thinking, you will likewise perish unless you repent. Mm -hmm. 
So this whole idea, what's the other side of that? Only the good die young. Some people say, well, if something happens to somebody, they were wicked. The other side of that is, well, it's because they were such a good person. That's why they died. Mm -hmm. Or here is another despicable uh, piece of rationale. Uh, when a baby dies, and I've seen pastors do this, I've seen people do this, and it makes me want to have a nauseous experience. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you mean blow say, chunks? They, <laughs> <laughs> he was so eloquent, wasn't he? <laughs> they say that little baby died. God took that baby mm -mm. because he looked down through time and saw that child was going to turn away mm -mm. from the cross and wind up in hell. And to spare that child, bring it to heaven, God took it to himself. Oh, How sickening. Mm -hmm. How sick you got to understand that death is a spirit. And God calls death, the Bible calls death the last enemy. So you're telling me that God colludes with his own enemies? If God colludes with his enemies, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Then God is in agreement with death. He's in agreement with hell. He's in agreement with the, the originator of cancer. Uh, all of these things. And so God and the devil, they're just all working together. Not. And so that makes God, uh, uh, it makes the devil and death equal with God in your life. It's sickening. And we so absolutely need to get that thinking out of our minds. And so they think Job is a terrible sinner. Job, however, he is absolutely entrenched in how self-righteous he is. And he will not hear a word of suggestion that uh, there's in any way that he made himself vulnerable by omission, commission, by being deposited in a particular environment, responding to things in a certain way. He absolutely rules out any possibility that there was anything in his character that opened him up, although he said it out of his own mouth. People tell on themselves, folks. Mm -hmm. Listen to them, they'll tell on themselves. Mm -hmm. He told on himself, he said, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. And so we know instantly in the third chapter of this, these, this dialogue, we know what's happening. And uh, Job's friends, of course they say, people always come back and argue. They say, well, no, God said Job was perfect. Then why does it say in Job 32 that Job was self-righteous? Does God look upon self-righteousness as a component of human perfection? No, he does not. Job's friends believe he's being punished by God for hidden offenses. Job agrees that God is the point of origin for his agony, but contends that he's merely being used for target practice. In Job 10.16, Job compares God to a fierce lion, lion hunting him down to destroy him, to devour him. This is exactly the same. Now, what is Job saying? And this is exactly the same comparison Peter made in 1 Peter 5, 8, except Peter was speaking of Satan. So Job's idea, Job consigns to God what is actually the activity of Satan. What Satan is doing, Job looks at it and says, look what God's doing to me, why God? And how many of us? We experience cataclysm, we experience calamity. And what's the first thing out of people's mouth? Why? God. How could God let this happen? God. The only thing we see God doing in Job is putting a hedge around the man to protect him from vulnerabilities in his life that opened him up to what eventually happened. Well, why did God take the hedge away? Because there's something in God that says his spirit will not always strive with man. And there is a point that uh, we, uh, in our willfulness and our stubbornness and our recalcitrance, to live out this life on our own recognizance, being accountable to the kingdom, that consequences become a part of our life. This God will not suspend the law of sowing and reaping in order for us to avoid the adverse consequences of the aspects of our character that contradict who God is in the earth. And so here Peter is saying, Job and Peter are uh, saying the same thing, but Peter is pointing the fi uh, finger at the devil. Job's pointing the finger at God. Job's attitude toward God and opinion is that God is the instigator of his pain. And that puts Job very close to blasphemy. Now I want to talk about blasphemy for a moment. The generally accepted definition of blasphemy is attributing the works of God 
to Satan, for instance, to say, to take glossolalia, the gift of tongues, and somebody hears that and says, that's Satan doing that. That is blasphemy. Amen. It's attributing the works of God to the devil. Another example would be Matthew 12, 24, when the detractors against Jesus accused him of casting out devils by the prince of devils. And that's where we get the idea of the unpardonable sin. What Job and his friends do is equivalent to this, but in the reverse. They attribute to God the works of Satan. It's the exact opposite. The New Testament concept of blasphemy is attributing uh, to Satan the works of God. What Job and his friends are doing is attributing the works of, God, of Satan to God. The exact opposite. And you have to get that in your head. Uh, <laughs> God points out to Satan that because in Job 1, verse 11 and 12, God points out to Satan that because of Job's fear, Job 3.35, all that Job has is in Satan's hands. Job, Satan says to God, reach out and destroy him, and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, au contraire, all that he has is in your hand. How did that happen? Because of Job's fear. Therefore, what Job and his friends see as God's severe treatment of Job actually originates with Satan. They're looking at what Satan is doing, and they're accusing God. They are attributing the works of Satan to God. Mm -hmm. Now, how often do we do this? A storm destroys our property, and the insurance company calls it an act of God. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, that's not covered because that's just an act of God. We don't insure against an act of God. Something good comes from something bad, and we attribute the good and the bad to God. Yes, you had cancer, but before you died, you led your doctor to uh, the new birth experience. And so God gave you the cancer and the opportunity to win somebody to the Lord. So we're just blaming the whole thing on God. One remarkable instance is that of quadriplegic Joni Erickson Tada. On her radio broadcast, she declares, and I'm, I'm being very conservative of how I'm not putting emotion behind what I'm telling you, because I don't want to be seen as picking on the crippled girl, okay? But yet she stands up in the authority of her disability and her condition, and she makes certain statements that impugn the character of God. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't move in pity and, and maintain your anointing. Where does your fidelity lie? in uh, deferring to the authority of a suffering person like Johnny Erickson Tada or to what God says in his word. You, ha you have to get there. And because we haven't been willing to go there, people have been deceived. Right. Mm -hmm. So on her radio broadcast, she declares that when she broke her spine in a swimming accident, it was actually God who was pleased to make her a quadriplegic for his greater glory. That's sad. Now, however tragic this may be, and regardless of the wonderful way in which Joni has served God in spite of her injury, and I'd be the first to say she's probably won more people to the Lord than I have. She's reached more people in her lifetime than I have. I'll concede that, but that's beside the point. There is no biblical basis. The scripture says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of your faith, not Joni Erickson Tata. There's no biblical basis for suggesting that God is the originator of the mishap that struck Joni down. The verse that Joni uses to make her claim is in Isaiah 53.10. Now listen to what it says. It sounds so spiritual. It pleased God to make me a quadriplegic. Her very words. Let's read the verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Talking about the Messiah. He hath put him to grief. Talking about God sending Jesus. To die when you shall make his soul an offering for sin mm -hmm. so this is God sending his spotless pure sinless son to be an offering for sin is Joni saying that her suffering is an offering for sin because that's what this verse is talking about it's talking about a sinless Messiah not a fallible person born into a fallen environment you, do you hear what I'm saying the colossal uh, arrogance of such a statement he, shall, he made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, prolong his days, and the pleasure of, pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
This verse speaks of the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross. Listen, folks, only Jesus can be made an offering for sin. That's right. Once for all. How many times, and I've heard people do this, uh, they're, they got a kid, he's on drugs, he goes out and wraps his car around a telephone pole, he's not going to make it, and you have a mama and a daddy saying, Lord, take me. Just take me, God. In other words, they're trying to pay for that boy's sin. No, we can't do that. Why can't we? Because our own personal sin debt is much greater. Right. From, from the calculus of your sin debt weighed against the calamities of life, there is no measure, not even Job's, the full bandwidth of the calamities that Job suffered are even the dust on the balance compared to the sin debt that he carries. And that's true even if you're talking of somebody like uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa has no footing to stand before God e than even somebody like Adolf Hitler. Because the scripture says our righteousness, the totality of our righteousness, is filthy rags when it comes to the calculus of paying the sin debt that every one of us were born to in the earth. And so Jesus was pure, sinless, virgin born. He was the perfect lamb, singularly and exclusively, I might add, capable of taking away the sins of the world. See, if Jesus was not sinless, then God, and if his, and Jesus, if the Father sending Jesus to the cross would not be the redemption of the whole world, then God would have been unjust to take Jesus to the cross. The justice of God sending his only son to the cross is that Jesus was sinless, he was perfect, and he was pure. And he made it perfectly clear when he said that our righteousness was as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. It's like that ought to end the conversation right there. Exactly. Filthy, mm -hmm. filthy, mm -hmm. filthy. So for God to send a person born in sin to their death or injury, as is generally believed in Christian culture, that God will do such things, uh, that is not compatible with what we know of God's nature. Jesus suffered for us. We cannot legitimately suffer for any reason other than arising from the consequence of being fallen creatures in a fallen world. Well, you're saying we're just subject to causality? No, Jesus actually said in talking about the Tower of Siloam, he said, unless you repent of thinking bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people, or now in the uh, pessimism of the day, only the good die young and the wicked get away with murder. Uh, unless we change our thinking, he said, you will all likewise perish. He, he was saying that what happened to the people that the building fell on was happenstance. It was random happenstance, which that doesn't make us very comfortable. You know, you pull out of a red light and you get plowed o over by a 18-wheeler. Is there no protection against random happenstance? But he yes. said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish, implying that even in the area of random happenstance, you can be protected. Amen. On the basis of your righteousness? No. no. But on the basis of faith in God, who he gave certain prerogatives to Jesus, of which Jesus then imparted to them to us by blood covenant upon the cross. Mm -hmm. And so the 10,000 angels that were assigned to just his foot, just his feet, yeah. I could call 10,000 angels lest I dash my foot against a stone. Just what is that? That's causality. That's random happenstance. Mm -hmm. How many of you stub your toe getting out of bed in the night? See, so there are angels. What's the assignment of angels? The, one of the most intimate personal assignment of angels is to protect you from random happenstance and causality. Thank God for Psalms 91. Huh? But if you, however, in the context of that preservation, you begin to think that random things that happen to somebody happen because they're wicked or God put it on them, all of a sudden the angels fold their arms and they say, because you're thinking like that, I can't protect you. Look out. Mm -hmm. See, why God? Why did this happen? Do you really want to know? See, we have this, they have this contaminated theology. And so we see God, and we blame God for what actually the devil is doing. And then we open ourselves up to random causality. And then when it comes to pass, we wonder, how could God let this happen? God didn't do it. So when we suffer, look, it's not God loving us. 
It's the devil hating us. It's not God giving us a message. It's Satan trying to confuse us. It's not God teaching us or using us to be a testimony of faithfulness in the midst of trial. That is completely inconsistent with the claims of Christ and what the Bible tells us of God's nature. Now, in the midst of suffering, God will love us. In the midst of suffering, God will give you messages. Amen. God, uh, uh, I can't take this. He says, do you trust me? Let me take it from here. One of the most powerful messages God ever gave me in my life. Mm -hmm. And it brought me to a tremendous miracle, brought me to total and complete breakthrough. It's not profound. I mean, my, you know, a child could have said that to me, but in the midst of suffering, God did not bring the suffering on. But as I was suffering, God, he's not going to forsake you. Brought relief. <laughs> okay. He will love you in the midst of trial. He will give you a message in the midst of trial. That doesn't mean he originates it. In the midst of suffering, God will teach you and give us a testimony to inspire others. People may get born again because you don't shake your fist in God's face, but keep loving him through the trial. However, just because God is with us in the midst of trial does not mean he is instigating our suffering as Job and his three friends suggest. Somebody told the story about, um, they'd emailed me, I haven't had a chance to answer them. They talked about uh, a minister. Okay, a minister in the authority of his office gets up and tells the story about a child or someone they knew who was rebellious against God. They had a health or some type of crisis. They wound up with their life in jeopardy. They were spared and gave their life to Jesus. And so they say, I know God made that happen. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. Where does he go to get that? He, there is no sickness in heaven. Mm -hmm. If God does that, then there will be cancer in heaven. There will be emergent clinics in heaven. There's going to be hospitals in heaven. Yeah. We're going to have, have to have Obamacare in heaven. <laughs> and all the Republicans said gasp. You know, and, and, you know, that is completely inconsistent. What part of human suffering did God not put upon Jesus upon the cross in order to teach you, spare you, love you, give you a message, et cetera, or punish you? The whole implication of that thinking is that God did not pour out all of his wrath upon Jesus, did not pour out all of human suffering upon Jesus. You have to have a theology that says God withheld a portion of his wrath, a portion of the sufferings of humanity aside for his ineffable purposes in teaching you, loving you, punishing you, giving you a message or using your testimony to bring people to Jesus. And that flies in the face of the simplest comprehension of the most inept theologian about what uh, the scope of salvation is and what Jesus has done for us. See, God will still work in the midst of suffering. He's not going to sit back and say, I'm not involved in that. No, he's going to love you. He's going to give you a message. He's going to speak to you. But that doesn't mean it originated with him. God is an opportunist. I used to get aggravated, God. You know, I'd go to the charismatic Catholic meetings, you know, and I was a good old Pentecostal boy. And they're standing up giving prophecies to Mary. Come unto your mother, children, and I'm there to preach the gospel. I'm like, God, how can you, how can you be involved? He said, I am involved in anything that people are involved in. God works in the midst of the mess that men make his wonders to perform. So in the midst of, God is with us in the midst of trials, but that does not mean he's instigating our suffering as Job and his three friends suggest and as many in Christian culture generally believe today. Okay. To Job's continued insistence of his own righteousness, Bildad declares that there's no state of righteousness or purity that exists in the created world. In verse 4, he states that in his view, even God himself cannot justify sinful man. This is a total and complete encapsulation of the performance-based approach to God. I remember growing up in an Assembly of God church. I got so aggravated. I'm like nine years old. You know, I'd go to the altar and get saved every Sunday. Every <laughs> Wednesday night, I'm getting born again. And then by the time, you know, uh, the next day before the sun went down, I have sinned again. And I'm like, okay, I hope the rapture doesn't take place. Uh, before Wednesday night. And Wednesday night, I couldn't wait for him to quit preaching, so I'd get to the altar and get saved again. 
And the same thing, Thursday morning, I sinned, I knew I sinned, my conscience smokes me, and I can't wait till Sunday to get to church on Sunday. And I sure enough hope they have an altar call because I got to give my life to Jesus. You see, performance-based religion. And I went to my pastor and I'm crying. I'm just weeping. I'm just so frustrated because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to come in, you know, and there's my parents' clothes laid out like something just took them out of their sure. clothes. How many of you ever uh, got the, uh, the the jeepers scared out of you on laundry day? You know, your mom's doing laundry and she went outside to, and you come in from school and something doesn't look right and you, something tells you <laughs> this terror rises up, the rapture took place and you got left behind. <laughs> and uh, and the, the pastor, he said, I mean, and I'm telling him this, you know, if it's all based on me being a good little Christian and I blow it before I get off the altar and he says, well, and, and you know, he wouldn't give me a straight answer, but he just simply said, well, it doesn't work quite that way. And what that told me is not that he had the answer, but that he didn't have the answer. And I realized that it couldn't work quite that way. So, so if there is things in your character that deviate from the template of the character of God, you have to understand there is a margin of mercy. And that mercy is not based on what a nice guy you are, that you were a good Christian in the past or you'll be a good Christian in the future. No, the mercy is based in spite of the fact that you haven't been a good Christian in the past and you sure ain't going to be one in the future. The mercy is based upon the blood of Christ. It's Jesus saying, Father, I want you to be tolerant with them and loving toward them. Uh, because of who I am and what I've done for them, not because of who they are mm -hmm. or what they have done or what they're doing or what they're going to do. And Father, we're not going to leave them where they are, but we're going to draw close to them. We're going to cause them to see me. And when they see me, they will be like me. And then your character will be transformed. Not because you're a good little Christian, not because you're trying to earn access to God. The scripture says we come boldly before the throne of grace by a new and living way in Hebrews that says that he consecrated. You know it takes consecration to get close to God. What you haven't figured out is that it's his consecration, not yours. Not his consecration produces your consecration. Mm -hmm. It produces, causes you to see him and you'll be like him. That's why, why you don't wrestle with sin. Don't wrestle with sin. If you must wrestle, wrestle with God. He loves it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when your boys, you think a daddy doesn't love it when his boys come pile on top of dad and we're going to whip him this time and dad just chuckles and he lets them just wear themselves out and has him good. God loves it when you wrestle with him. <laughs> but if you wrestle with your sin, it's like wrestling with a stuck pig, with a greased pig. You're going to get all over you what's all over the pig. Mm -hmm. That's what Romans 7 is about. The things that I do, want to do, uh, I'm not doing. The things I don't want to do, <laughs> sin by reason of the commandment, I'm doing the very thing I know I'm not supposed to be doing. Who's going to deliver me? Jesus Christ is going to mm -hmm. deliver you. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be like him. And all of a sudden, you become the God man, the God woman in the earth, because of the influence of his ambient presence in your life. And that takes off the table all this despicable doctrine that accuses God of what actually is originating with Satan himself. So Bill Dad and his, and his friends, uh, and Job for that matter, making their thinking an irrevocable connection between their actions and character and their idea of what is required to approach God. See, that's why Bildad says God is not capable. They are so convinced that the only way to approach God is performance-based. They say even God himself cannot justify man. They have no understanding of the unconditional love of God that takes responsibility for the sin, the sinner, and the consequences of sin. In Christ we become new creatures. How can you be a new creation in Christ Jesus and be a worm? <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.17. It, it transforms who we are. And really God is more uh, focused on who you are than what you do. Because if he, who you are does not change, what you do is hollow consecration. It's hollow obedience. It's hypocrisy is what it is. Uh, in Christ, we have forgiveness for every action of transgression. Ephesians 1.17 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. How many of us try to make nice with God? You blew it. You know you blew it. You have no excuse. And so what do you do? 
if when you get done accusing everyone else and making excuses for yourself, if you have any guilt left over, you're going to go out and truly really try to be a good little Christian until the heat's off. You know, you know, you're, you, you got it coming and you're having trouble believing because of sin in your life, skeletons in your closet, and we're trying to earn some, be good little Christians, mm -hmm. put an extra dollar in the plate, be in Wednesday night, go to the Wednesday night prayer service where, of That'll course, they, where of course they don't pray, but that's beside the point. And we're trying to perform, trying to fit into this paradigm of what holiness and righteousness and, uh, you know, it's this whole thing where, you know, the, the mommy looks at the little boy and says, that's not my little boy. My little boy wouldn't do that. Oh, don't do that to your children. You're teaching them performance-based mentality. See, see, in the in in Christ, the rigors of the fall and in his forgiveness of sin. Remember, sin is first and foremost is who you are outside of Christ, not just what you do. People say, "Well, you're forgiven for sins you have committed, but you're not forgiven for sins you are committed or sins you will commit." Big, big controversy in evangelical yes. circles. Oh, in other words, God's holding against you what you're doing now. No, he's not holding against you. Does that mean you're not going to have consequences? Oh yeah, baby, you're going to have consequences. <laughs> See, there's no, there's no excuse because what the sin is a, is a symptom of a deficient relationship with Jesus. Because if we press into him, we see him, we become like him, and then righteousness becomes our nature. It becomes who we are, not what we do. And so the righteousness that God is interested in is the righteousness that proceeds out of the natural manifestation of who we are in Christ. If there's sin in your life, uh, and uh, sin, I've had people tell me, sin, what is that? You know, mm -hmm. it's what you're thinking right now. <laughs> and uh, uh, sin is symptomatic of a deficient intimacy with the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's whatever is driving that distance, whatever is constituting that distance between you and God that is so broad that your character is independent and separate and of a different nature than his, whatever that is, the substance of that, that is what is putting you in jeopardy at every level of your existence. Mm -hmm. Not God picking on you no because you're so righteous. <laughs> so, in Christ, the rigors of the fall are reversed. We are relieved of the curse and brought into a place of both temporal and eternal benefit and blessing. It's what John 10.10 10 says. You cannot find cancer in John 10.10. 10. He came that we might have life and life more abundantly. You cannot find uh, destruction. You cannot find any of the things that people blame God for. At no point in all of this, in the full scope of redemption, do we see God vacillating he doesn't say, I, I became poor so that you could be rich. I took uh, sickness so that you could be healed. At no point does he do that and then say, oh, oh yeah, point of order, fine print. Uh, I can say, just kidding, anytime I want to and put on you what I promised to take off of you in the cross. See, at no point does God withhold for himself the right to suspend his promise in order to impose personal suffering upon us for any reason. Now, theology says that is actually their definition of sovereignty. The definition of God's sovereignty, according to theology, is that God can suspend fidelity to his own word, that we're trusting him to be the same yesterday, today, and forever, that God can suspend faithfulness to his own word for some ineffable purpose. No way, Jose to love us, punish us, give us a message, use us as a testimony, yakety schmackety. Uh, there are reasons that we suffer. There are reasons. And that suffering does have its origins that can be found out. But they have nothing to do with God arbitrarily or capriciously choosing to afflict us for any obscure or ineffable purpose. Since we have a few extra minutes, would you share the revelation God gave you um, this weekend about being good stewards or something? Oh, brother. You've got time. <laughs> it's kind of bonus material. Okay, bonus round. Look up. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody borrowed your car and they brought it back with a cracked windshield, torn upholstery, and a knock in the engine that wasn't there before, Would you loan it to him again? <laughs> I've had a lot of people with a certain mentality. Well, of course I would. Yeah, well, give me the keys. I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, Let's test that theory. 
to think about our own health. The Bible says we are stewards of the mysteries of God. You know, I know a guy, he's 350 pounds if he's an ounce, and he defines his calling as, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. I'm like, buddy, you're not steward of your own physical body. What about our own our own physical bodies? Mm -hmm. If God gives us a perfectly good physical body, and at the end of the day we bring it back to him in worse shape, then we gave it to him and take no responsibility, but feel like we have been victimized. How does God respond to that? Now, in his graciousness and his mercy, he lets us have that body for another day. So it's commentary on the mercy of God, mm -hmm. but it's also commentary on our own character. You're a steward of that body and what you do or do not put into it. You're a steward of that body. And now this is like Paul said, sometimes he spake by the spirit. Sometimes he spake by permission. So let me speak by permission. So let's just count those piercings and tattoos. Hello. See, you're a steward of that body. God gave you that body. Are you being a good steward? See, one of the problems with uh, um, weight loss regimens and the diet culture, it's all legalistic. And even a lot of the Christian weight loss regimens, it's just the worldly approach to this devastating legalism. We give a command, you must reduce caloric intake, you must become more active. And it's Romans 7, by reason of the command, sin rises up and slays you. And so you start out on a diet to limit your calories and to exercise. And at the end of the week, you put on five pounds, see, because of the legalism. There must be a path of grace that is relational, arising from intimacy with God, by which... We become stewards, this, which borrowed. This is a borrowed physical body. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to bring it back to the Father, beat up, <laughs> broken windshield, knocking the engine, torn upholstery, handing the keys and say, thank you so much, Father. Would you get, let me be a steward of the mysteries and show me what the seven thunders have uttered? You know, to God's credit, he continues to do what none of us, I just loved the responses I got on Facebook. You need to make them fix it. Okay, that's right. It's like Nathan with King David. You know, somebody stole a lamb and David stole somebody's wife. And David said, let them have it. My daughter wrote in and said, because it was first just the question about the car. She said, Mama, did someone tear up your new car? <laughs> so all of those responses, I'm thinking that's exactly what that person needs to do for, uh, for his own sense of stewardship of his life. Our relationships. Absolutely. Our stuff. My goodness, our stuff, our homes, our furniture. Does it belong to us? No, the scripture says we're bought with a price. Yeah. Oh, that's legalism. You put me under legal. No, I'm not. I'm pointing out a fact. Your body doesn't belong to you. How much in the scriptures say you're, you're the temple of God? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they, the new Christians were continuing at frequenting temple prostitutes because it was their way of life and had been for a thousand years. Saying, no, you, your body is not your own. You've been bought with a price. You're the temple of the Lord. In other words, we should treat everything in our life. Our next breath is a matter of, of stewardship. The compunction upon us is to know that every moment and everything that we enjoy in life is a gift from God that we did not earn. It is not our right. We are stewards of these things, the bounty that God has given us. Even the stuff that we think it's my body, I can do with it what I want. No, it's not. No, it's not. And it's just this point of, in the, and, and it's driven by this. You're not gonna let somebody else hold you into accountability. Right. This is a day, we live in a day that the Bible talks about truce breakers, rebels, rejecting authority. That's the day we live in. It is our nature in the modern world, in the information age. Follow me and I'll make you. Ain't nobody gonna make me do anything. So leadership needs to jettison this whole fact that you're gonna see people submit to you the way they submitted to Paul, and they didn't submit to him, by the way. Uh, Peter, an apostolic culture that domineers and is lords over God's people, that's been tried for so long and it fails miserably. How about having the uh, integrity 
not to impose religious and illegitimate authority upon people's lives. How about modeling what stewardship looks like? How about as leaders we model what it is to understand that we are just stewards over these lives and demonstrate that to the people that we lead so that hopefully they will say, I'm going to put myself on my own recognizance. You know, most pastors don't have pastors. Most church leaders have nobody that they answer to because God enables them to live this life out on their own recognizance. And for the most part, they're pretty effective at it. And so that's, we need to teach people as leaders what we've been doing for generations. Who pastors the pastor? I got news for you. Nobody pastors the pastor, particularly in evangelical circles, unless they have been involved in a real constrained culture that's like apostolic Amway. Where everybody's got a downline. This is my apostle who's an apostle for the apostles. That's like apostolic Amway. You know, we're selling Melaleuca. No, we're not doing that. No, it's about as leaders, we want to demonstrate living this life out on our own recognizance as stewards of what God has given us. And I found it was interesting the timing of it because he, Russ has been pressing that this is a year of accountability, accountability where to be accountable sons and daughters of God. And so it just aligns itself with God once more. So Father, we thank you for revelation knowledge and we thank you that um, we can see it. Um, it's burned into our hearts and it's the desire of our heart to give you uh, what you paid for that you get the full benefit of what Jesus died to give us and to give you Father God that he would see his seed and be satisfied that we're not slowed down by any um, drag on our bodies uh, physically emotionally mentally that we are freed Father from the curses that seem to be binding so we break off curses off of us in the name of Jesus, even uh, illegitimate authority that we've allowed for many years. In ignorance, yes, but now we're no longer ignorant. We know the truth and the truth makes us free. So help us, Father, to be free and to serve you with our full temples the way you desire us to be examples in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.